Hello, everyone, and welcome. I am Jance Malbro, the Population Health Manager with LDH's Office of Public Health, Bureau of Regional and Clinical Operations. First, helmets off to all of you who have joined today's Lunch and Learn to bring awareness to Prostate Cancer Month. This Lunch and Learn is brought to you by the Office of the Secretary, Policy and Quality Improvement, and Employee Engagement and Training Teams. The presentation is entitled, Tailgate Talk, Prostate Cancer. September is observed as Prostate Cancer Month. The ribbon for prostate cancer is light blue. Prostate cancer is the second leading cause of cancer death among men in Louisiana. All men are at risk for prostate cancer, but it is more common in older men. It is also more likely to occur in men with family history of prostate cancer, and also in men of African-American descent, and may cause no signs or symptoms in its early stages. Today, you will learn more about the importance of prostate cancer from Dr. Ross Cockrell, urologist at the Baton Rouge Clinic. He will share his playbook on prostate cancer, prevention, screening, and what to do after a diagnosis. He will also discuss the importance of communication with your primary care physician and how to take charge of your health. Again, our speaker for this presentation is Dr. Ross Cockrell. Dr. Cockrell is a respected leader and medical professional in the Baton Rouge community. He is a board certified urologist and licensed in the state of Louisiana. He is involved in many professional organizations such as the American Urology Association, the Indo Urological Society, American College of Surgeons, American College of Physicians, and the American Society of Clinical Urologists. He has presented both robotic and prostate cancer research internationally and has written several chapters both on general urology and robotics, along with being an ad hoc reviewer for the Journal of Endourology. In 2017, he joined the, uh, the urology department of the Baton Rouge Clinic and is currently accepting new patients. Please note that we will take questions at the end of the presentation, so please hold all of your questions. And then they will be promptly placed with your questions in the chat. Now we'll turn it over to Dr. Cockrell. Dr. Cockrell, you may now share your screen. All right, Jance, thank you so much for that uh, very nice introduction. I, I thank the Louisiana Department for Health for the opportunity to, to cover such an important topic in men's health, especially in Louisiana, given those numbers that he discussed previously. Um, we have a slideshow that we're going to go through. It's kind of a foundation is we did try to make it a little more engaging with kind of a football background. Um, it was going to be uh, about prostate cancer, uh, a little background about prostate cancer, including uh, things we can do to improve <clears throat> screening and diagnosis and treatment and long-term outcomes and cancer specific, cancer specific mortality and morbidity, which are important metrics when you look at prostate cancer. Uh, next slide, please. So kind of our game plan for the day, you know, is we kind of, again, need to build foundation of um, of our talk is what is a prostate? You know, a lot of guys, that's one of the first questions they ask me when they come to the clinic and they've um, been sent to me for further evaluations. And what does it do? Uh, we're going to talk about our opponent, prostate cancer. We're going to have a little scouting report about prostate cancer itself. We're going to talk about prostate cancer screening. Uh, we're going to talk about the diagnosis process. We're going to talk about treatment options. And then at the end, we'll have a little huddle up and Q&A. Next uh, slide, please. Um, so what is the prostate? The prostate is a gland. You can hit the next button, too. There's a little diagram there. Uh, the prostate is a gland uh, in, found only in men. It's deep in the pelvis, right at the base of the bladder. You can see that in the picture, um, that kind of um, that red uh, balloon-looking structure above the yellow arrow. Is the, is the bladder, which of course holds urine. But the prostate's primary gland when we're um, younger men and we're trying to uh, uh, grow our families is, is procreation. It, it assists with um, aiding in the sperm's ability to get to where it needs to go. So it's got special nutrients in it and sugars. It's got some things that um, essentially helps the sperm do its job. It's about the size of a walnut on average. Uh, so not all that big, but it it absolutely varies amongst men. Um, as men get older, uh, the prostate tends to grow. And so we take that in concordance um, too in regards to 
uh, screening and diagnosis. Uh, but it can also cause issues with urination as men get older. Um, men can develop uh, infections and have bleeding from it. But the main thing we're going to talk about today is the overall risk in prostate cancer as men get older. Next slide, please. Um, our opponent, cancer, prostate cancer specifically, but cancer by definition is a disease caused by the uncontrolled division of abnormal cells in a specific part of the body. Like we said, specifically prostate cancer today. Um, uh, cancer, a lot of times I, I describe cancer um, and today we'll describe it, describe it almost as a spread offense, right? When you, you look at a football team and their offensive plan, the more weapons on offense they have, the um, the more daunting that team is. And, what, you know, they have to make sure they have a good quarterback, good offensive line, wide receivers, running backs. And the more weapons they have, the more aggressive that team can be. The same works with cancer. Cancer can have all these capabilities. Uh, and the more capabilities it has, the more aggressive it can be and the more we have to look out for it. Um, that includes anything from being able to spread into the adjacent cell. Uh, some cancers can make their own blood vessels, um, which is important for cancer nutrition. Um, you know, so these are all modes that uh, some of the medicines we use for other cancers to attack. Um, but that that's cancer's job. So can, just because it's prostate cancer doesn't mean it can't go elsewhere. Uh, it, its primary job is to grow and to spread. Um, and our primary job as physicians is to catch it early and stop that and treat it. And um, so guys can move on with their lives. Uh, families can move on with their lives. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> the diagram of uh, the bladder, the prostate um, is kind of that kind of mirrored glass look. Um, again, a little background scouting report for prostate cancer. About one in seven men will be diagnosed with prostate cancer in their lifetime. Um, it's the most common type of uh, cancer in men. Um, in the United States, there will be about 180,000 men that will be diagnosed this year, new diagnosis of prostate cancer. But you also have to look in the sense that <clears throat> um, it's it's a it's the second highest uh, risk prostate cancer as far as death goes in Louisiana and uh, top five in the world. But a lot of that has to do with the commonality of it, how many men have prostate cancer. So the more men that have it, the more likely... Um, they are to die, even though the overall uh, mortality of the cancer itself is not that high. So that's that other stat. There are over 3 million prostate cancer survivors in the U.S. today. And that ability to beat the cancer is really important. <clears throat> um, and what's more important is catching it early. And that can really determine and project what the outcomes are long term. So that's um, what we're, again, talking about today. Um, as far as side effects, I have a lot of men come in and they're like, I don't know why I'm here. There's nothing wrong with me. Um, uh, and, and that's a reasonable argument. But the interesting thing with prostate cancer is very rarely does it have has symptoms unless it's very far advanced. And that's when you start seeing issues with weight loss, um, real difficulty with urinating, uh, blood in the urine, uh, bone pain, uh, changes in appetite. <clears throat> and those are seen in more uh, aggressive cancers that are um, usually have, have progressed and, and that brings me back to another point, you know, when it comes to taking care of your overall health and your prostate, you know, I tell my guys, treat your, treat your body like your car, right? You don't wait to run out of gas before you put gas in the tank. You check it. You check the tank every now and again to make sure everything's okay. And that's what it's about going to the doctor, just making sure everything's okay. And, you know, our body is a very complex machine and things are bound to happen in, um, Generally speaking, the earlier you catch it, the better options you'll have moving forward, whatever the disease process is. Next slide, please. And there's the blue ribbon. I think there's two, yeah, blue ribbon um, for uh, prostate cancer awareness in September, uh, awareness in September, which is prostate, prostate cancer awareness month. Next slide, please. <clears throat> um, you can do the next slide. I think there's a little animation coming in. There we go. So the best offense is a good defense, right? So that's what I was talking about, you know, the, the analogy with making sure your, your car is in good shape before you go on a road trip. You need to treat your body that way. You need to keep the maintenance up. 
so important to establish care with a PCP, which is a primary care provider. Um, that's a, a internist, a general practitioner, a nurse practitioner, um, getting access to care and screening for not just prostate cancer, but all things that um, can cause um, uh, shortened lifespans, including diabetes and hypertension, cardiac risk, uh, and including these cancers that we're talking about, the, the prostate cancer specifically. So when you see a, a primary care doctor or your urologist, um, some of the first things they do is they're going to take a history and a physical, and that's when they're going to talk about, you know, uh, what's your family history? Anybody in your family with prostate cancer? The ones we really look at are um, your grandfather to some extent, father to more extent, and brothers even more so. Um, so genetics plays a large role. As far as other screening goes, um, the physical part of it would include lab work, which may be blood tests, maybe urine tests, depending on the doctor, as well as his, and his exam. <clears throat> as far as risk for prostate cancer, we really start screening um, at age 45. Um, you can request to be screened earlier if you have a strong family history of prostate cancer. And um, I, I don't think many doctors would turn you down for being proactive. A family history, you know, we went for that one in seven risk. But if you have a strong family history, it's one in three. Um, ethnicity, uh, men from African descent and Caribbean descent have an increased risk. Uh, occupational exposure, there's some data to support men from the Vietnam era and Vietnam War that were exposed to Agent Orange um, have increased risk of prostate cancer. So we have to be aware of that as well. Um, and there is some data to support men that are over 50 that are obese um, have an increased risk of prostate cancer. Uh, next slide. Um, blood, the big blood test that we that we do is um, called a PSA, uh, prostate um, specific antigen. That's a typo, sorry. Prostate specific antigen. Um, and an antigen is really, I go in this a little bit on the next slide, but it's really like a logo. You know, every, you know, you, if, you're, you, if you're, you're rooting for the Tigers, you see LSU, the purple and gold, um, you know, you know that immediately. That's LSU, that's Baton Rouge, those are the Tigers. Uh, that's their logo. Uh, within our body, um, there are logos and we call those antigens. So we can count those logos or those antigens in the bottom and give in the body and it gives us kind of a snapshot idea of what your prostate health is. Um, another part of the screening um, test is the exam. Um, you know, I put the number one up there because that's, you know, part of the exam, right? The, the finger wave. So when a urologist or a doctor is doing the rectal exam uh, for prostate cancer, we're, we're feeling for um, asymmetry or uneven, unevenness within the prostate or any hard nodules within the prostate. Um, next slide. <clears throat> Um, you can hit the next button. I think there's a picture or two that pops up. Again, like I talked about the antigen and the logo, I use Nike in this one. When you see that Nike swoop, you know automatically what it is. Same thing with antigens in the body. We have machines that can count those antigens. We'd like for that PSA to be less than 4.0, but there's variability within that. Um, age, the older you get, the larger your prostate gets. Um, as your prostate gets larger, it will have more antigens. Um, and that's the next size, size of your prostate uh, infection. If you have a uh, infection or inflammation of the prostate, your PSA can be falsely elevated. Sexual intercourse and specifically ejaculating can make your PSA elevated. There's some medications that can more specifically decrease your PSA. So we have to calculate um, and accommodate for those changes. Um, there is a thought that spicy foods or acidic foods can sometimes falsely elevate the PSA. To what extent a lot of the data is unsure. Exercise um, can sometimes increase it as well. That'd be more specific like um, bicycle riding for long distances. So sometimes we accommodate for those changes as well. Um, and then there are other tests beyond PSA uh, that are a little more detailed that usually are, are ordered by a urologist once you present um, with an abnormal PSA to start. Uh, there are um, uh, the prostate health index, there's something called a 4K score, there's a free and total PSA, all good tests, and we will usually order those at our discretion based on our concern uh, for prostate cancer. Next slide, please. Um, some additional testing, once you make it to your urologist, uh, if we're concerned about prostate cancer, um, for, for me personally, uh, I think it's becoming the standard of care is when someone comes in, uh, I have them get a, a, a 
a new PSA. If they have one abnormal one, I'll usually order a specialized PSA. And the next step for me, um, as long as they're eligible for it, is an MRI of their prostate. And that shows me a couple of things. One is the size um, of your prostate. And two, it looks for any abnormal lesions within the prostate that would be concerning from uh, uh will be concerning for cancer. Um, there's some urine tests that are newer that are being rec uh, recommended by the um, uh, National Cancer um, Detection Groups. The one I use specifically is called ExoDX. It looks for uh, biomarkers in your urine that are associated with higher risk prostate cancers. And this last thing, PSA density, that's another calculation that we do that accommodates for larger prostates. So that that's a, a, a density percentage down there. We always want that density to be less than 0.15. And as long as it is, you're statistically at a lower risk for prostate cancer. So these are all things that I look at, you know, PSA, um, the rectal exam of the prostate, MRI, family history, um, and then the PSA density are the five big things I look at. I do, if there's some ambiguity or gray, grayness in those five things, I may add ExoDX or some people request it and I'm happy to order that for them. But all of those things um, are in preparation for the next thing, which would be a biopsy, which we'll talk about in a second. Next slide, please. <clears throat> and there's some lab work right there being done on the on um, some specimens. Next, please. Um, what is a biopsy? A biopsy is when we actually take samples from the prostate and look at it underneath the microscope. This is actually uh, a prostate biopsy um, with prostate cancer within. And we do that um, depending on how you present and, and which urologist you see, but it's something uh, specifically done by a urologist. Uh, and we usually do it transrectally. So a probe would go into your rectum um, and we take samples of your prostate. If you remember that picture from the beginning, it's, it's located right there beside that area. And so we generally take samples of the prostate and we send it to a different kind of doctor called a pathologist. And the pathologist looks at those tissue samples and um, tells us what they see, um, specifically whether there's cancer or not. Next slide. Um, when we get those samples back uh, from the pathologist, they give us grading and, and, and additional things would, do, would be staging but the grading, my analogy for grading, um, the actual scale that we use is called a, a Gleason grade and score. Uh, and you can see over here, um, it goes one through five, five being the most aggressive. We've come to find out over the years that, that Gleason grades one and two really aren't cancer. Uh, three, four, and five are. So we, we um, tend to be uh, more directed in our um treatments and, and planning moving forward when those numbers are a little bit higher. Um, staging has to do with whether or not there's cancer on both sides of the prostate, extending beyond the prostate and the lymph nodes, and all those things can determine what treatments we choose. And so those treatments, again, will be determined based on um, the age of the diagnosis, the stage of the diagnosis, any comorbidities and side effects. Um, uh, of those treatment options, which we'll get into in a second. Um, there's always a discussion about how, how quickly should we seek treatment once diagnosed with prostate cancer? And that's a great question for your urologist because it's different for everyone based on the timing of the diagnosis and staging and grading. There are some cancers that we just watch that we don't actively treat. The treatment is observation because they are non-life-threatening. Um, and so the timing is uh, really can be subjective based on the doctor, excuse me, objective. Uh, next slide, please. Um, going, in, going into the prostate cancer treatments, um, uh, observation, which we talked about, which is a form of uh, treatment where we just observe and watch, look for changes in, in the cancer. Um, is it growing? Is it spreading? Uh, and a lot of that's dependent upon the actual grade of the cancer at the time of diagnosis, your PSA, and your other staging workup. Everything has to be kind of within a very narrow criteria to, to qualify for that. And that's specifically active surveillance. And watchful waiting, you know, we'll have guys that come in that are that are um, much older and have a lot of other co comorbidities that 
it's unlikely that prostate cancer will play a major role in their overall lifespan and morbidity. So we can watch those um, carefully and make sure that it doesn't get out of hand. Um, but we spend more time and effort uh, um, assisting with their other comorbidities, whether it's diabetes, or renal failure or um, congestive heart failure, things like that. They all play a role. And there's a hierarchy of, um, of care. Uh, one option um, when we do active surveillance or, um, excuse me, watchful waiting in men that aren't great candidates for uh, therapy uh, would be some, uh, uh, you know, curative therapy with something like hormone therapy. Hormone therapy is non-curative in nature, and it's really meant to kind of slow the cancer down uh, if given alone. It's, it's not a first line choice. Because again, it's not curative. It's it's more a palliative therapy. And it's really, the way I explain it, it's like throwing a bucket of water on a fire. The fire is put out, but the embers are still there. They're still burning. Um, and uh, they can come back. So hormone therapy in and of itself uh, is, is not always the first option. Um, but there's always exceptions to the rule. Now, hormone therapy can, can be used in conjunction with other primary therapies, specifically radiation. So radiation, there's really two major options. One is the seeds, which everyone's heard of. That's where we implant radioactive seeds in the prostate. In a sense, the prostate's treated from the inside out. Um, then there's external beam radiation. That's where radiation is passed um, to, to the prostate specifically to treat um, for the cancer. And it's from the outside in. My, I say it's almost like a shining a flashlight at the prostate with... Um, um, radiation to to destroy that cancer uh, and a lot of the a lot of those instances with external beam um, radiation uh, hormone therapy is used in conjunction we've seen an improvement in overall outcomes surgery is another option that's what a urologist does that's what someone like myself does the standard of care now is um, robotic prostatectomies um, and that's it, it, some, some of the older urologists will still do open prostatectomies, but not very many. <clears throat> it's been proven to be superior in uh, the amount of uh, complications, including blood loss and hospital stay. So you're able to get out of the hospital a bit sooner and the blood loss is much less. And so there's very few instances of requiring a transfusion. Uh, there's something that's, that's a little bit newer that's still um, in, in the, in, per, in my perspective in investigatory or experimental stages is it's focal therapy, meaning they only treat the cancer and, and not the entire prostate. <clears throat> so the focal therapy sometimes is done with, um, freezing, which is called cryotherapy. Some guys, some have used lasers to actually go in. One of the major problems is it's not very often we find one little area of advanced cancer that needs therapy. It's usually pretty um, large tumors within the prostate. So if there's multifocal regions, it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to, to treat all those areas separately. Um, instead, we, we choose to treat the entire gland, which would be whole gland radical prostatectomy. Um, nerve sparing is the, is the big term that... Um, uh, we all use when we do radical prostatectomies. Um, and so uh, the, the focal therapy, again, I, I don't, you know, I don't know of many um, opportunities to seek that therapy locally because it's still so experimental and it's it's difficult to follow people after um, without doing lots and lots of biopsies. So we, and we try not to do that if we can because of the, the complications from repair, uh, recurrent and repetitive biopsies. Uh, next slide. Um, side effects, you know, when we talk about prostate cancer surgery specifically, um, all the guys uh, want to know about the two major side effects they hear about, and that's erectile dysfunction, ED, and urinary incontinence, which is urinary leakage that's involuntary. Um, these are very important questions to have with your doctor, your surgeon, you choose. Uh, you know, different doctors have different numbers as far as their success rates. Um but it, what I tell all my patients is there's so many factors that play a role in the out and those outcomes, um, you know, and, and that's, that could be another one hour conversation just about that. But uh, know that there are side effects <clears throat> there. You're likely to have some of these with post prostatectomy, um, but you, they're usually temporary in most instances and whatever side effect there is, there is a treatment for there's, we can fix it, whether it's erectile dysfunction or urinary leakage, 
there are surgical and non-surgical options for both. Uh, and so uh, it, it's not something that's insurmountable or impossible to manage. You know, there are side effects with, with radiation as well. Um, you know, radiation, a lot of it is, you know, uh, what we call lower urinary tract symptoms or LUTs with urgency, frequency of urination. Um, you can have bleeding. Uh, you can have erectile dysfunction over a given period of time. And what I tell my guys, first and foremost, is it's so important to speak with a radiation oncologist. That's the type of doctor that does the seeds um, and the external beam radiation therapy. It's important to speak with them because they're going to have a, a more uh, uh, intimate knowledge of those side effects. Uh, I can help treat them, um, but they can give you a, a greater insight in, into your chances of, of needing um, that therapy. Um, but what I tell you guys is radiation seeds, um, external beam, they tend to have a cumulative effect. So I generally don't recommend external beam radiation or seeds for men younger than 60 or 65. Um, cause the longer you live after your radiation therapy and treatments, um, it, you tend to have more side effects from it. Um, so younger men tend to get surgery first. It gives them a nice backup plan that if their cancer unfortunately does come back, um, that you still have radiation as a backup plan. Uh, number next. Next slide, please. There we go. Um, and when you see your doctor, and unfortunately, if you do um, get a diagnosis of prostate cancer, uh, some great questions to ask your doctor. Um, there's some great resources out there. Uh, I tell guys, be really careful about getting on uh, message groups and listening to an an anecdotal stories and, and people that aren't necessarily qualified to, to discuss prostate cancer treatments. It's very important you speak to someone that's qualified, and whether it's your primary care doctor or, or a urologist. Um, if you go to websites, I usually recommend, recommend websites that are um, you would recognize as a healthcare um, source. You know, MD Anderson, Mayo Clinic, Memorial Sloan Kettering, uh, the American uh, Urologic Association has um, some great resources, but I mean, there's some great questions, you know, what we've talked about, you know, what kind of prostate cancer do I have and how aggressive is it? Um, you know, all these things are, these are great questions to have, and you can take a screenshot of this if you do have questions for your doctor and, and, and take to him and go over those things um, with them. Next slide. <clears throat> Um, this kind of brings us to our Q&A portion, our huddle up at the end um, in regards to any questions you might have about um, testing or screening, uh, risks, uh, prevention. You know, I, I didn't go in great deal of, uh, into prevention. Um, unfortunately, there's not a whole lot of things out there that have been shown to be uh, successful in preventing prostate cancer. The thing that we always um, tell men is um, heart healthy diets are great because um, that's going to be of, of more importance in your lifetime um, to most men, um, cardiac health and staying, you know, we talked about um, uh, obesity and prostate cancer risk. So, so watching your weight, um, all those things are, are, are very important. But the best thing is, is, you know, like I said before, you know, keep gas in your car, check the gauges, do the same thing with your body. Make sure you go to your doctor, make sure you get things checked. Don't wait till you start having problems because then your options can be limited. So it's important to, to maintain those things. Get your tires rotated, change your oil, see your doctor. Thank you, Dr. Cockrell, for that information and insight. At this time, we would love for participants to type their questions for Dr. Cockrell into the chat and they will be read and addressed accordingly. Uh, yeah, so that that can be that can be difficult as far as developmental disabilities and the physical exam. The blood work can be acceptable. Um, in that, there's some data going around right now that. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't I didn't read the question. So, do you have recommendations for how to prepare men with intellectual and developmental disabilities for the physical exam? Would blood work be acceptable as an alternative, or is the physical exam a must? So um, there is uh, a movement, especially amongst the primary care providers, where they're not doing the physical exams anymore. Um, uh, I think as a urologist, because it's what I do, it's such an integral part 
of the screening process. Um, but a lot of the data reports that and for the general population, you have to screen, forget the exact number, but it's a lot of, you have to screen, do a lot of rectal exams to get one positive one. So it's, it's um, losing its popularity amidst, amongst primary care doctors to the, the uncomfortable nature of the exam for the patient. Um, but if, if you make it to a urologist, most urologists are going to perform a rectal exam to make sure um, that everything is okay from that. Um, another question is screening part of an annual exam. It's another great question. Uh, does insurance treat prostate screening as a preventative procedure? Uh, it absolutely should. Insurance should cover your PSA uh, screening. Um, as far as the annual exam, there was another about, I want to say seven, 10 years ago, there was a committee that comes, that meets and reports back and decides whether or not certain screenings or vaccines or um, what should be done as far as um, uh, a primary care doctor's job. And they, for short term, recommended against prostate cancer screening um, for, for a lot of reasons. Uh, <clears throat> but we've discovered in that time that we've seen a very large uptick in men with advanced prostate cancer showing up that missed their opportunity to be treated earlier. Um, that they may end up not dying of prostate cancer, but of something else, but they had to be treated for advanced prostate cancer and that quality of life, uh, and, and and that would affect their quality of life. Um, and so th they, in, in short, need to make and ask your doctor to include that as part of the screening process. Um, one of the, some of the numbers out of the LDH um, that I saw in preparing for this, that of men um, that are eligible for prostate cancer screening in Louisiana, only 37% of men were actually screened. Um, that's, that's a low number, right? And so I think it's important that if we can get those numbers up, I think that we could make a, a larger impact in catch, catching prostate cancer earlier and, and making an impact on that number two rating as far as uh, morbidity, cancer-related morbidity from a prostate cancer. Um, um, Ms. Brown asked, what's the earliest symptom that can indicate prostate cancer? Like we indicated in the slides, there, prostate cancer is generally um, asymptomatic. Uh, they are, uh, it doesn't really become symptomatic until you get to where the disease is much more progressed and metastatic in most instances. Uh, some of the early um, symptoms that can be seen, one is something called hematospermia, that's blood in the ejaculate. But if you look at the literature, um, it's not just because you have that doesn't mean you have prostate cancer, um, but it can be a potential side of that's a that's a, a low likelihood. Um, blood in the urine can be a sign. Um, uh, difficulty urinating. Uh, the big one that we see in men that, that present with advanced prostate cancer is the inability to urinate at all, significant weight loss, onset bone pain, because one of the areas that the prostate cancer spreads to the first is is the bones. So you start having significant bone pain, weight loss, appetite changes. So those are things to look out for. But screening is one of the most important things to catch it early to make sure that you have, again, options for treatment. Um, screening eligibility. Um, you know, the, the, Amer uh, the American Urologic Association recommends men <clears throat> uh, 50 to 55 and older be screened annually. Um, one of the things we do talk about is, and a lot of men, we will stop screening after the age of 70 to 75, and that's because of normal life expectancies. So we have to weigh this kind of balance of quality and quantity of life and um, whether or not we decide to, to move forward with diagnostic testing and biopsies and possible treatment for a disease that may not be um, the primary concern for mortality in a patient. So we have to, and that's another discussion with your primary care doctor and your urologist uh, in regards to whether you <clears throat> need to continue with PSA testing or you could stop at a certain age. But every male is eligible. I would say after 45, uh, you can start requesting PSA testing. Um, and if you want to go see a urologist to kind of establish a relationship with a urologist, I, I joke with guys all the time when they come see me and it's kind of a one visit deal and they don't have any more problems. I always tell them you, you got somebody in the bullpen if you need them, right? You, all, you got a urologist. Um, at some point, most men will require some assistance, whether it's with prostate health, including cancer, including urinary issues, from erectile function to hormone therapy uh, to kidney stones. 
Um, all those things, um, nighttime urination called nocturia, all those things are within the realm of a urologist's care. Any more questions? Those are the only ones I'm seeing. But again, I, I still think one of the the, the important take-home messages here is to make sure that you um, find a, a, a primary care provider that that you trust, that you like, that you can communicate with easily. Um, the nice thing now is there's so many points of access for care uh, that you can kind of uh, pick and choose who you want. If you meet somebody you don't feel comfortable, you can you can search, find someone else. I, I think it's so important. If you're comfortable with someone and you can um, talk with them that your ability to get the care you need um, is expedited and more efficient. A couple more questions. Um, is there medicine to decrease prostate size? There is. There's two class, There's two meds out there right now called finasteride and dutasteride. They're in a class of meds called 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, um, and they shrink the prostate. Um, we usually don't give those at the beginning because they take longer to work. And they do have some side effects that are um, not popular side effects for men. They're rare side effects. Um, uh, there's you know, some promising data going into the next one. Are there new treatments being developed? There's some data out there that might be supportive and that these 5-alpha reductase inhibitors might be pro protective against prostate cancer. We can't say that for sure. I mean, they're still doing studies on that and they're trying to get um, enough numbers to make sure that the, the findings are statistically significant for recommendations. Um, uh, again, the, the big thing that we talked about, the focal therapy uh, is, the, is the newest um, shop on the block um, in that you can get and treat just the area of cancer. I, I think that might be the future of prostate cancer treatment. It's just we're still trying to figure out the best ways to do it um, and, and finding the, the perfect candidate so they get the best outcomes with the fewest amount of side effects. Because that's what that's what we all want. You know, that's what the doctor wants for you. Um, that's what your surgeon wants for you. Uh, and that's, of course, as a, as a patient, that's what you want. All right. But thank you all so much for your time and attention. It was an honor and a pleasure to speak with you all today. Please don't hesitate to reach out to me if you have additional questions. Um, and find you find you a good primary care doctor or urologist and um, establish a relationship and take care of yourself. Thanks. Thank you, everyone, for those great questions. Please take note of our LDH's Cancer Policy Team's contact information that's on the screen. If you have any cancer-related questions, please contact them. Lastly, we would like for you to please complete a brief evaluation survey. Um, once you leave the presentation, you will be prompted to complete the survey. Again, we appreciate you all for taking the time to participate in today's Lunch and Learn session, Tailgate Talk Prostate Cancer. This concludes our presentation. Also, a special thanks to Dr. Cockrell and the Baton Rouge Clinic for presenting and sharing this great information with us today and our LDH policy and quality improvement and employee engagement and training team for this collaborative initiative. Uh, please remember all men, let's take ownership of our health. Schedule a visit with your primary care provider today to get screened for prostate cancer. This presentation has been recorded and will be made available and hope you all enjoy the rest of your day. See y'all. Thanks.